So today's stream is going to be about eutrophication and water pollution. If you didn't already get this, hi, I'm Harrison Burnside, and I'm going to be teaching you AP Environmental Science today. Um, so I'll get started. Think Fiveable on your favorite social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and I think we have a Snapchat account coming soon, but not yet. And make sure you're always learning, thinking Fiveable. Okay, so in this stream, I'm going to talk about Water pollution and eutrophication. So we're going to talk about what is eutrophication, hypoxic zones, DO and BOD, oligotrophic lakes, human impacts on wetlands and mangroves, and the relevant legislation for this exam. And I'm going to go over how you would tackle a practice FRQ for this topic. All right, let's get into it. So what is eutrophication? Eutrophication occurs when a body of water is enriched in nutrients. So basically, um, something causes way too many nutrients, usually nitrogen and phosphorus, so nitrates, nitrites, and phosphates, chemicals that are usually found in fertilizers, somehow run off and get into lakes or bodies of water, and it becomes enriched, which means that it gets way too much nutrients too fast. There's a study, there's a set amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that things in the water need, the plants underwater, the fish in the water. There's a set amount that they can handle, but once it gets outside of their range of tolerance, they can't handle too much more, the excess of nutrients. So how does eutrophication happen? So the increase in nutrients and eutrophic, this is a lot of big fancy words, the, new, the increase in nutrients in eutrophic aquatic environments causes an algal bloom. So, but even before that, what happens is there's some kind of runoff from fertilizer used in agriculture or some kind of runoff from um, any kind of cow manure or animal poop that contains nitrogen and phosphorus from a farm. Somehow rainwater picks it up, it runs off into a waterway, and then after that, these nutrients from the runoff, the rainwater, are going to go into the lake and cause an algal bloom to happen because these algae feed on nitrogen and phosphorus and they love it, they can never get enough. So once the algal bloom, also known as algal mats on top of the water, when they die, uh, microbes and bacteria come in and digest, eat it away, decompose the algae, and they also take away the oxygen in the water. These are when you're aerobic, the oxygen using decomposers come in. So aerobic means they need oxygen to do their job, to decompose their organisms. But anaerobic means they don't need oxygen. So in this step, you're getting the aerobic decomposers coming into the water, taking away all of the algae, decomposing it, but also taking away all the oxygen. And what happens here is you get a decreased de dissolved oxygen level in the water. I see a question in the comments right now that I'll help with after I go through these steps. But if you have any questions, you can put them in the comments or put them in the ask a question section whenever you have questions. And then the last step is that the lack of dissolved oxygen results in large die-offs of fish and other aquatic organisms. Now, something that most people don't know is fish can't just breathe water. So how fish breathe underwater is that there's something called dissolved oxygen in water. So as humans, we breathe oxygen and we drink water. Same way that fish do. They just can breathe the oxygen underwater. Humans, our lungs can't breathe the amount of oxygen that's in the water, but fish and plants and other aquatic organisms, they can. They can use the oxygen from that water while not, you know, drowning, which is how they live underwater. So when there's not enough dissolved oxygen, when all of it's taken up by these aerobic decomposers and other microbes and bacteria, that means that there's not enough dissolved oxygen for the fish and other aquatic organisms to breathe, to use it. So then they all have to die. But then there's more decomposers, more anaerobic decomposers, and it just starts a cycle and it creates a nasty space. Um, and in the comments, I'll get to the questions now. Are there any other effects other than decreased dissolved oxygen levels in water as a result of algal blooms? Um, yes, there are more effects. So you can see that this all leads to the die-offs of fish, it, the loss of biodiversity, Whenever you're going through an FRQ, going through the steps, you can always say, and this leads to a loss of biodiversity. 90% of the time, something like that, loss of biodiversity is on the rubric. That's one of the like magic answers in AP Environmental Science. Um, so any other effects? Basically, 
Um, there are other excess nutrients added. The algae takes away some more nutrients, but nothing really about eutrophication that algal mats. Nothing else you need to know for the AP exam in terms of water pollution. If you think you have something else, you can put it in the comments and I'll talk about it. But nothing that I can think of. And Elena says the die off of fish is a result from the lack of dissolved oxygen. When did the levels get too low for the fish to survive? So that's actually, um, it depends on the type of fish. I'm going to pull up a graphic for you that I like, but some fish can survive with a lot less dissolved oxygen, which is measured in PPM, and a lot of them can't. So some fish like carp, which are called trash fish, um, can survive with like as little as 2 PPM, but fish like trout and bass require a lot more. They can require up to eight parts per million oxygen in the dissolved oxygen in the water. So um, if you're looking for like standards, a low dissolved oxygen is like two when you're like fully eutrophied. But um, a usual normal level of dissolved oxygen is like eight-ish. And that's when you have your um, bass, trout, mayflies living in the water happily. But let me go see if I can pull up that graphic for you. Oh, I think that this is it right here. Let me see if it'll load. I'm going to put it on top of the slides here. I hope that you guys can still see it. I hope that it's not. Oh, it is blurry. Okay. I'll try to help you guys read the graph, though. Um, so right here, this says clean zone, and that's where your trout, perch, bass, mayfly, stonefly, they all live. And this is a high level of dissolved oxygen. This is about an eight parts per million here. Um, but as you get the pollutant right here, so this could be eutrophication, this could be the excess nutrients coming from runoff, rainwater, your DO will drop. And then right here, it gets to about 2 ppm. This is where your really tolerant fish, like your carp, your sludge worms, they can live all the way down in this area. And then the lake will sometimes recover. You'll get some more trash fish, not as bad though. And then you'll be able to have up to 8 ppm of oxygen again. I hope that helped to answer your question. The levels get too low for fish to survive when they get a, these um, clean zone fish, as they're called, the trout, bass, perch, mayfly. Um, they're going to survive at around 8 to 7 ppm. They don't really have a large range of tolerance, but once you get to the trash fish, they can survive with like 2, 3, maybe even 4 ppm. They're not really picky like the other ones are. So I hope that helped it to answer your question, Elena. If it didn't, please say something in the comments again. And Joey, did you talk about the positive feedback loop? No, not yet. I'm going to talk about the different feedback loops in the um, in another part of the stream. And it looks like I have another question from Ethan. Can the eutrophication process be reversed? Um, sometimes. I mean, that's always the answer in AP Environmental Science. Um, so can the eutrophication process be reversed? That's a question. Good question. But, um, basically the environment usually has a way of fixing itself. Once we get all the anaerobic decomposers coming back in, sometimes the DO rebels will rise if there's no more runoff of, um, bad, basically once there's no more runoff with the nitrogen and phosphorus, um, there can sometimes be no more, you know, there's no more nitrogen and phosphorus. So there's nothing for the algal mats to bloom, to feed on. So that's when you see your rise in PPM, just like in that graphic earlier on the right side. Um, you could see that the ecosystem was restoring itself. But if we look at some other sources of water pollution, most of those can't be reversed. That's a really good question. Thanks for asking. All right. So. Moving on. Uh, eutrophication, so you can see the nitrogen and phosphorus, which usually comes um, from rain, from runoff of rainwater, get in. These bacteria kill, they take away all the dissolved oxygen, this algal bloom that the decomposers are coming in to eat. Then the algae dies, it decays at the bottom, covers all of the dissolved oxygen at the bottom for any plants that they give off in cellular respiration. But some of these plants can't even get sunlight because these algal mat blocks the sunlight from coming in and it's so thick that no sunlight can leach through to the bottom. And then you lose food, habitats, and oxygen in these ecosystems. 
Um, Dana asks in the chat, what's the difference between eutrophication and cultural eutrophication? Um, cultural usually refers to anthropogenic, which is just a fancy word for human, man-made, man-caused sources. So if I just like take all of my, if I'm a farmer and I take all of my fertilizer and cow manure and dump it at the bank of a river, yeah, that's going to be cultural eutrophication. Eutrophication can also just be natural. If I just like let my cow poop sit in the barn, if I'm a farmer, <laughs> the cow manure, um, if I just let that sit in the barn and some heavy rain comes up and takes it away, that's usually a source of just eutrophication. So cultural is just going to say when you can prove that a human caused it, anthropogenic is the fancy word for that, Anthro anthropogenic sources. This bottom diagram I'm going to talk about again later. Um, but what happens in places that are eutrophied? They become hypoxic zones. So hypoxic waterways are those bodies of water that have really low dissolved oxygen. So this can be an effect of the process of eutrophication. Um, so these hypoxic zones with eutrophication, because of this decreased availability of dissolved oxygen, everything has to die. That's why they're called hypoxic zones. They're also referred to as dead zones because nothing can live in these areas that have no oxygen. The fish can't live, other organisms can't live. There are algal mats laying on top so none of the plants can get sunlight. I mean, and the anthropogenic causes of eutrophication, just like cultural eutrophication, like Dana said, is agricultural runoff and wastewater release. So like if I take, this is really nasty, fecal water and I just dump that out somewhere and put it in the Yeah, I'm going to get a lot more bacteria than just eutrophication, but also there could be some nitrogen and phosphorus and other nasty stuff mixed in there that could cause eutrophication to become a hypoxic zone. Okay, so I have a new question in the ask a question section. How does eutrophication affect the layers of the ocean, e.g. the sunlight zone, the twilight zone, etc.? Okay, so basically, um, eutrophication is going to block the sunlight from coming in. So usually layers of the ocean that'll get a lot of sunlight, depending on how thick and how wide the algal bloom mat is, the sunlight's not gonna be able to get through. So there really are no zones. Everything's gonna basically become a benthic zone in this area that's hypoxic or that's been eutrophied because nothing can live there anymore. I mean, only the anaerobic decomposers and trash fish that don't even need anything to live. Like they can literally just sit outside of water and still live sometimes. Um, so a lot of sunlight isn't going to get to these areas, the different layers of the ocean. The sunlight layer usually has a lot of fish like the um, trout and bass and mayfly and the twilight zone also has some of those fish. But these places are going to basically have a loss of biodiversity because there's no more fish. And then the algal mats block the sunlight from even reaching the bottom, some of the benthic layers. So only plants or organisms that chemosynthesize are gonna be able to still survive. I hope that answered your question, Jocelyn. All right, so Mary asked in, oh, I'm sorry, I need to go up. Elena asked what created the hypoxic zone? Eutrophication, I mean this, the process of eutrophication is what's come, makes these zones that are hypoxic. Um, is there anything, Mary asks, is there anything you can do to speed up or increase the decay of algae? Yeah, adding more aerobic decomposers. Um, somebody can try to go in and remove different microbes from the water, try to add different nutrients into the water. Sometimes a solution, it's not very effective. There's not really a way to <clears throat> um, increase the decay of algae besides just adding more decomposers like humans or something else goes in and specifically tries to add and affect the process and just add more decomposers. There's nothing more than that to speed up the decay of algae. And basically after the algae has decayed enough and fall into the bottom, like in this um, graphic back here, um, after the algae has fallen to the bottom, if enough of it has fallen, then the eutrophication can try to reverse itself, like somebody said previously. But there's not really much else that you can do besides that to increase the decay of algae, just adding more decomposers. All right, I hope I got your questions answered. Oh, then now there's another one. Oh, then now there are two more. Okay. Um, could an increase in temperature create a hypoxic, hypoxic zone, or is it just a decrease in sunlight? 
Um, so Aliyah asked, is the increase in temperature creating the hypoxic zone or just the decrease in sunlight? So there is a relationship between dissolved oxygen and temperature. And if the temperature goes down, if the temperature goes to, I'm sorry, I don't know why the heck this is plugged in going off. Um, I'm sorry, so sorry. If the temperature increases, sometimes the dissolved oxygen can decrease on its own, but usually with hypoxic zones, it has to be caused by eutrophication. But in rare cases, like an increase in temperature causes a decrease in DO, temperature and dissolved oxygen are inversely related. That can cause an increase in temperature, can cause a decrease in dissolved oxygen, which could cause a hypoxic zone. Um, good question. And then Jocelyn asked, if the pH of a body of water affected by eutrophication changes, will that speed up or slow down the process? I mean, I guess sometimes, um, but the pH of the water is usually not going to change the process. I mean, not to my knowledge, it could have. So if it can, somebody tell me in the comments, but I don't think that pH can change eutrophication. Okay, but good questions though, good questions. Um, let's see, moving on. So hypoxic zones have these algae mats on top. These mats prevent sunlight from getting down to the plants on the ocean floor for photosynthesis. Sunlight is required for photosynthesis, just like carbon dioxide. Um, and then these dead plants allow for the anaerobic bacteria to come in and decompose all of the dead plants. So basically, these plants are going to die, and um, the decomposers are going to come in, and there's just going to even be less dissolved oxygen sometimes. And back to the pH. I mean, eutrophication can change the pH just because it can definitely make it, like, more acid, more acidic, or more basic, but the pH, the change, nothing can just change the pH to change eutrophication. Usually that won't change the process, but the process of eutrophication, oh, whoa, what just happened? Oh, okay. Okay, can you guys still hear me? Um, my computer just went all nuts. Um, let me try to share my slides with you again. I'm sorry, that was weird. My computer has never crashed and shut down like that before. Okay, everything looks like it's back to normal on my end, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, all right. Um, this is just another summary of hypoxia. So it's just low oxygen, and it can be a problem for estuarizing coastal waters. Why I talked about those is those are two of the most like biologically diverse, have some of the most biodiversity in water ecosystems uh, per cap. Per, like per area, obviously, because some estuaries are very small, but they have lots of biodiversity, lots of different plants and animals. So these hypoxic waters have dissolved oxygen contents less to two or three. So when somebody's asking about the levels of dissolved oxygen that fish can't live in anymore, it's usually around two parts per million oxygen. I don't know why this is talking about milligrams per liters, um, but I guess you can relate that to PPM sometimes. And this hypoxia can be caused by a variety of factors. Usually it's by eutrophication, but sometimes, usually the AP exam won't ask you about these other two reasons, but um, the stratification, the layering of the ocean um, can be changed because of the change in temperature. If there's less sunlight reaching it, then the layers may mix. This can cause like um, sediment mixing into the water, which is never good because then that brings up all sorts of other nutrients that the water doesn't need. Uh, then we have the algae mats coming in, which is eutrophication, the dead algae decomposed, the oxygen is consumed, and then nobody can live there anymore. All right. I hope you guys understand hypoxia and the basics of eutrophication, and if you don't, then please say something. Oh, is my audio off? Um, can anybody else hear me talking? It's fine. Okay, so it's just you. Um, maybe try closing out of Crowdcast and getting up. Okay. <laughs> Lots of interaction in the stream. I think that this is actually one of the highest record um, ape streams. Yeah, I think this is the most people we've had registered for an ape stream before, so that's great. I think that a lot of new people are getting on to five whole weeks of the schools closing and stuff. 61 people, that's a lot. Okay, so I've said these things before subconsciously just because I say them a lot, but a lot of people actually don't cover what DO and BOD are. 
So these are acronyms that the AP exam can use because they're in the course and exam description. So DO is dissolved oxygen and BOD is biological oxygen demand. And just like DO and temperature, which is dissolved oxygen and temperature, um, they're inversely related. So when one goes up, one goes down. And when the other goes down, the other goes up. Um, so when we have eutrophication, and because of all of these aerobic decomposers coming in, they're going to take all the oxygen. So that means the levels of dissolved oxygen are going to decrease, which means that biologicals, like fish, things that are living, are going to demand more oxygen. They're going to want more oxygen. And this makes the hypoxic zone, which is caused by the loss of oxygen. And under these algal blooms, like in this picture right here, um, you can see that these nutrient-rich surface waters don't allow for things. These are like carp fish, I guess, or maybe some other organisms that can survive without high DO levels, but usually DO and BOD, dissolved oxygen, biological oxygen demand are inversely related. Um, so somebody, Jocelyn asked, Jocelyn asked, what is biological oxygen demand? So basically that's just how much oxygen the biologicals, which are just the things that are living, the biotic, biological, the biotic factors in the ecosystem want. So biological oxygen demand is how much dissolved oxygen the biotic factors in the ecosystem want. So they demand more dissolved oxygen. Basically, the fish, which is a biotic factor, want demand to get more oxygen. It's really just in the name. Like if you try to think about things in apes, if you AP environmental science, if you try to pull apart words and like look at prefixes, usually you can try to figure out what a word means. Yes. So if you don't get anything, please always ask questions. Lots of good questions, lots of participation tonight. Thank you guys so much for that. So yeah. Now, oligotrophic. Oligotrophic is the opposite of eutroph eutrophic. It means that there are like no nutrients in the water. They have low amounts of nutrients, stable algae populations, no mats, no, no extra things forming, but they have really high dissolved oxygen. So if something's going to have really high DO, what is it? What else does that mean? Can anybody tell me in the comments what's going to happen if I have high DO? Oh, and as a preface, dissolved oxygen does not change temperature. Temperature can change dissolved oxygen. Yes, when we have a high, thank you, Joey, when we have a high DO or dissolved oxygen, we're going to have a low BOD or low biological oxygen demand because there's enough oxygen for things to flourish, even though you can see there's not a lot of things in here because there's no nutrients. So we have the same problem with oligotrophic lakes. Until we get nutrients in the water, things don't want to live there because think about it. That's like saying, okay, us humans can breathe all the time that we want to but you're not allowed to eat food. So basically these nutrients can act like food for these fish sometimes, they power them and live. That's like taking your multivitamin every day, supplements, anything like that. Fish don't want to live there. They can live other places. They can't move to other places unless there are rivers around, but they don't wanna live somewhere where there's no nutrients. If I can breathe fine, that's perfect. Like the dissolved oxygen, that means that the fish can breathe fine, high levels of dissolved oxygen. <sighs> I can breathe just perfect, but with a low amount of nutrients, nobody wants to live there. I mean, I don't want to live somewhere where there's not food. That's just a given. And the stable algae populations is just saying that there's a high dissolved oxygen content, but not too high. All right, so oligotrophic is the opposite of eutrophic. All right, let's see. And with that, is there anything in between eutrophic? and oligotrophic. Yes, so there is something in the middle. I'm gonna go back to that diagram from this page right here. Oh, darn it, now you can't see it because of my cursor. So right here, on the right, you have a oligotrophic lake. You have a few things living in there, not a lot. You have nothing living on the bottom because there's no nutrients, no soil for things to live in on the bottom of the lake. You have your oligotrophic right here. On the far right side, you have your eutrophic lake. It looks nasty. Way too much nutrients. Um, no, Joc Jocelyn asked, is oligotrophic ideal? No. Oligotrophic is not ideal. It's a nutrient-poor system. But on the right, we see eutrophic. We see 
that there's way too many nutrients, it's shallow, there's a lot of soil, there's a lot of algae and bacteria. You can see this like increase right here from this middle one. That's because of all that dead algae and all of those extra chemicals and nutrients that we don't want in the water. But then in the middle right here, you can see perfect tappiness. You can see like even the, I think that those are birds, I guess, flying around because it's just so perfect. It's such a perfect ecosystem. You can see a medium amount of plants on the outside. You can get sunlight. There are more fish in that one than anything else. It's just nutrient perfect, dissolved oxygen medium. Everything's at a medium level. It's like the Goldilocks of trophic lakes. Everybody wants to be a mesotrophic lake. Fish can live there. Plants can live there. There's a stable amount of algae. Oligotrophic is not ideal. That's like if your forage is too cold. Eutrophic is like if your porridge is too hot. But mesotrophic is like your Goldilocks, perfect temperature porridge. I can eat it all day. Sound good? If you don't understand anything, please don't hesitate to ask questions as I'm moving on. Now I've talked about oligotrophic, mesotrophic, and eutrophic, the three stages or types of trophic lakes. All right, anthropogenic impacts on wetlands and mangroves. That's a big phrase with lots of vocab words, so I'm gonna break it down. Anthropogenic, human, impacts, what we cause on wetlands, a type of ecosystem that's wet and on land, and mangroves. Mangroves are another type of um, wet ecosystem, aquatic ecosystem with trees. So basically this is talking about the human effects that we have on these types of aquatic ecosystems. So wetlands are areas where water covers the soil, either part or all of the time. Um, usually wetlands cover the soil half the time, half not. There are a lot of wetlands on our east coast, especially like in Florida and the southeast coast, because in the summer, like in the Everglades, there will be a lot of water covering. I mean, not in the summer, like in the fall and winter, we see a lot of water covering the floors and the surfaces of these places, but in the summer, we see all that water not covering. We see the ground is mostly dry and not wet. So wetlands do not have to be wet all the time, contrary to popular opinion, thought. And what is a mangrove? A mangrove is can be a mangrove forest or a mangrove wetland. So mangroves are characterized by their dominant plant growth, the mangrove trees. Usually terrestrial ecosystems are characterized by the dominant plant growth, but aquatics can also rarely be, um, by, be identified by their dominant plant growth, the mangrove trees. They're actually very adaptable trees. They've survived a lot. They've adapted through a lot. They have been in favor of natural selection a lot. They have giant roots. They have big trunks. They can survive in a lot of, a lot of environments. Wetlands are really important to us living. Let me tell you again, wetlands are really important. They have a ton of ecological services. Can anybody in the comments name the four ecological services? The four types of ecological services, or at least one of them, maybe? Maybe got a few people say some. Does anybody know any of the four types of ecosystem services? No, not sun, the four types of ecosystem services. I'll give you one, provisioning. Provisioning is an ecosystem service, type of ecosystem service. Does anybody know the other three? I know that some people on this stream should know what the ecosystem services are. Cultural, cultural is an ecosystem service. So we've got regulating is an ecosystem service. Cultural is an ecosystem service. Provisioning is an ecosystem service. But there's one more. So we've got regulating, cultural, provisioning. Supporting, yes, good job, Jocelyn, you got two of them. So Dana and Jocelyn, good job for knowing the ecosystem services. All right, so we've got the four ecosystem services, regulating, supporting, cultural, and provisional, provisioning. So wetlands provide four of these, all four of the ecosystem services, and they actually provide a lot of them. So how do they provide, let's go with what Dana said, cultural. Well, wetlands, tourism, the beauty of nature. People love to visit places because they're so beautiful and aesthetic and nature, beautiful. Um, but then we also get uh, regulating, supporting, and provisioning because water purification, which means that this water is pure. Humans can drink it. Things can live in it. We can use it to shower. We can use it to grow plants, water things. That's regulating, supporting, and provisioning, all right there. Flood protection. 
supporting the ecosystem, not letting it to get destroyed by floods, water filtration, kind of like water purification, allowing us to drink the water, use it to have habitats for fish, and then allowing us to have habitats. Um, wetlands are some of the most important ecosystems, just like coral reefs and mangroves. Coral reefs, estuaries, wetlands, mangroves, those are some of the most important and diverse ecosystems. Um, and then threats to these wetlands and mangroves are just like we have threats to every ecosystem on earth that we learn about in this class. We have commercial development. People are building houses. People are building offices. People are building cities on these ecosystems. Dam construction. Dams are good for power, hydroelectric power. It's a renewable energy source, but it hurts a lot of fish along the way. And it also can cause flooding downstream. Uh, we've got overfishing. Over harvesting, that's one of the letters in HIPAA, which is an acronym to talk about the um, ways that we're hurting the earth, that humans are hurting the earth, and pollutants from agriculture and industrial waste. Hmm, pollutants from agriculture, what could those be? Maybe nitrogen, phosphorus, oh, eutrophication. Maybe, maybe eutrophication is hurting these wetlands and mangroves, and maybe we can't reverse eutrophication in some of these places because it's so far advanced. And now that I've covered the slide, I'll go and see what questions we have. So Ethan asks, what is being done to protect these mangroves? Glad you asked. We have um, departments in the US, the National Park Service, the Forestry, the um, Wildlife Protection Service that help protect these mangroves that are habitats for organisms and also protect the natural beauty of places like mangroves and other we have a lot of cultural protections for these because of ecotourism and not just mangroves, but every ecosystem. Um, we're also having wildlife officers staffed there to stop people from overfishing without permits. And we're trying to curb point source pollution in the US with different legislation that we're about to talk about. I think that's actually one of the next slides is the required legislation that we're gonna learn about to help protect the ecosystems in the United States and internationally. Good question, Ethan. All right. Um, and then Jocelyn asked in the comment, wouldn't erosion be an impact of flooding? Yes, this flooding can destroy habitats by eroding everything away. Like if they take away all the rocks and all the soil that the trees use and plant themselves in, we can't use those anymore. The trees can't live there. And now I think we're about to talk about the legislation that's helping to support these places. So we have the Clean Water Act and the Safe Water Drinking Act. Now there's tons more required legislation for apes. They actually have a list and you can ask your teacher like what legislation do I need to know, what history, anything like that. But there are two main ones that affect what we're talking about in this stream about eutrophication and um, the human impacts on wetlands. So basically we have the Clean Water Act. One of the biggest, most important, most tested, I guarantee you there will be a question on your AP exam about the Clean Water Act. Um, legislation that was created in 1948, strike that, like it was created, it was basically just a suggestion back then. Hugely, 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 hugely. It was really honestly just created in 1972. It set the maximum permissible amounts of water pollutants that could be put into waterways to make surface water swimmable and fishable. So this act really helped to protect a lot of places like wetlands and mangroves, like look back here. We have pollutants from agricultural and industrial waste. Now we're limiting what we can do. We're limiting our ocean dumping. We're banning dumping of pollutants into oceans now. In the 1980s, we used to throw everything into the ocean. Places like New York City would just throw all of their trash and garbage off Staten Island into the Hudson River, into the Long Island Sound, just to get rid of it. Out of sight, out of mind, right? <laughs> and then we also have the Safe Water Drinking Act that was made two years after the Clean Water Act to be able to keep our drinking water safe. Now I've seen this act come into play to help in places like Flint, Michigan that were hurt by lead poisoning in their water. In, 1940, in 1974, we set the maximum contaminant levels for pollutants that basically said uh, no pollutants, no heavy metals, no toxic things in our drinking water. Because these are, we're seeing studies in the 70s that are saying, whoa, these things in our drinking water are causing cancer and birth defects and all sorts of horrible, nasty, awful things that we don't want in our drinking water. So the Safe Water Drinking Act also helped to protect ecosystems and rivers because we get a lot of water. We have water purification and water filtration in wetlands, 
and some of those wetlands can be our water sources. In Dallas, one of our major water sources is Lake Ray Hubbard, Lake Lebon. We're protecting the ecosystems in those areas because there are drinking water sources by even saying that we can have lower pollutant levels than what's in the Clean Water Act because we're using this for our drinking water. So we see how one piece of legislation set to help our drinking water is actually also helping ecosystem services too and helping organisms that live in these ecosystems, the waterways. All right, if there's any questions about legislation, I'll take those now. Um, I can show you what legislation you need to know at the end of this stream for the whole course of apes. There's a web page that College Board says that, oh yeah, you need to know all of these and what they are for the exam because we can ask you questions on these. But if there's not any questions, then I'm gonna move on to this practice FRQ. Now with coronavirus, it seems that a lot of you have free time. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna go there yet. If there's a question in the question box. All right, so Jocelyn said, in your opinion, is legislation effective? That's like saying, in, in your opinion, does the sun help light the earth? Yes. Yes, legislation does help to curb some things. Now, just pushing legislation through Congress doesn't always solve problems. Like, there's never anything, like, we can say that murder's illegal, but people will still commit murders. We can say that dumping pollutants into the ocean is illegal, but people will still do it. Um, it's effective. It helps stop about, like, 80 to 90 percent of people who will do it just by saying there's a law, there's legislation in place. Now people won't dump anymore, but there's still people who will dump into oceans and let their cow manure run off into the waterways. So legislation is effective most of the time. All right, another question. Anaya asked, what is done to enforce these laws within individual states? Um, there are wildlife officers, which actually have more jurisdiction than police officers. So to enforce the laws within individual states and enforcing laws all across the U.S. in natural parks and natural wildlife habitats, natural protection areas, um, we have these wildlife officers who, if you're overfishing or dumping pollutants, they can actually do a lot of things. They can take away your method to get there, your transportation. They can seize your weapons, any fishing nets that you try to use to overfish. They can take away any guns you try to use to kill animals that are endangered species. And they don't have to do it because a lot of these places like Yellowstone, it's in such a remote area in north um, western Wyoming. Like there's no major city. There's no New York City in northwestern Wyoming. Um, so a lot of places like courthouses and um, state legislatures are really far away. So wildlife officers have to have a lot of jurisdiction to help enforce these laws and make sure that our national parks and national wildlife refuges and national forests are safe from people who are trying to violate this legislation. Great question, Naya. Anya, I'm sorry, I don't know if I pronounced your name wrong. That's definitely my bad. Okay, so I'll still take questions, but right now I wanna go over this. As I was saying, with coronavirus, you're gonna have a lot of time on your hand at home. Like I know my school district, we're not even allowed to assign work till next Monday. And in certain states, like I think Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, you guys have um, union labor laws where teachers can't actually assign work to students and they're not allowed to do work if they're not paid outside of school. So a lot of you have a lot of free time on your hands. But you also need to prepare for your AP exams because as of now, AP exams are still going on. They're still gonna go forward. So here, the 2015 FRQ number one is actually very effective and it's very relevant to the stream. So Joey says in the comments that he just did this practice today, this morning. That's great. If you're practicing and doing these FRQs, that's great for the exam. The writing is one of the most important parts of the exam. It's worth half of your score. The multiple choice is worth half, and then your writing is worth half. You need to make sure that you can write. You can come up with your own ideas and not just guess on every question. B, 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 B. <laughs> so I'm going to give you guys two options. You can either just be able to, after the stream or on your own time this week, you can Google um, 2015 AP Environmental Science FRQ question one, and then this will, a PDF with this will pop up. And then you can also Google scoring guide and try to score yourself and see how you did with these questions. Or you guys can, if you want to put in the comments, or I can even invite you up onto screen so you can talk about what you would say in any of these sections. So um, I'll put a poll out right now in the poll section and 
So I'm going to call it option. So option one is going to be that you guys can just do this on your own time, um, do it at home. But then option two is going to be we can work on it right now in the stream, type answers in the comments. But option three is going to be that I can invite some of you guys onto the screen, onto the stream, and then you guys can talk about like what you would write if this was your AP exam for any of these parts. All right, so I put the poll in now so you guys can go vote on which option you want to do. So one is on your own time, out of sight, out of mind. I can just do this some other time. I'm off school for like a month now, right? Um, option two is we can work on it in the comments. Option three is I can invite you guys up onto the screen on the stream and you guys can talk about what you would write. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to vote. And while you're voting, we have another question from Jocelyn. Thank you for being engaged in the stream, Joey and Jocelyn. I know you guys have said a lot of stuff. A lot of you guys have two. I've just noticed their names popping up a lot, so I'm sorry if I'm not recognizing you too. But uh, Jocelyn says, in your opinion, to succeed on an FRQ, what should you keep in mind? One big thing. Explain it like you were talking to a two-year-old. Um, you need to explain and go through every step. So if you were having an FRQ about the steps of eutrophication, you need to go and connect one thing to the next. So I would need to say um, excess... New, uh, nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus go into the water from runoff from agricultural sites. These nutrients cause algal mats to bloom on the top of the water. When these algal mats bloom, there is no sunlight for photosynthesis. Um, because there's no photosynthesis, these plants can't live. These plants can't survive in the water, so they die. When the algal mats die, decomposers come in to decompose the algal mats. When these decomposers come in, which are aerobic, they use all of the dissolved oxygen. With no dissolved oxygen, all of the fish will now die. And then with no fish and no plants, we have a loss of biodiversity in the lake. Period. End of story. It's not like you're explaining it to a toddler, really. You just need to go step by step, assuming that the reader knows nothing about eutrophication. Go through every single step. Connect it. Make sure that it's smooth so that your reader can really know what you're trying to understand. The readers want to give you the points, but they have to know that you know your stuff. Great question, Jocelyn. Um, uh, Maggie says, is there a way to make the screen bigger on my end? Um, sometimes there's a full screen mode, but if not, you can just Google 2015 APES FRQ. And I, the first thing that pops up is the scoring guidelines, but the second thing that pops up... The link, it's the PDF to this. You can pull it up, make it as large as you want in your Safari, in your browser, whatever, right here. If you Google APES 2015 FRQ, it'll be the second link that pops up, I think. And the scoring guidelines is the first link that pops up, actually. So I'll go look at the results of the poll now. It looks like nine of you want to do option one, so just go do it on your own time. A few of you want to do option two and three, though, which... Um, Oh, okay, so some of these votes are changing. Um, so it looks like, is one of you trying to mess with me? So add a lot of detail, but don't drive off topic. Yes, make sure you connect it. Go step by step. Go into detail, but don't go off topic. That's something that they hate. Are you guys playing with the poll right now? Are you really just clicking on and off the vote button so I can't read it on my screen? People who have too much time on their hands because of the coronavirus. Or maybe my crowdcast is just not working. This website is... Wonderful. All right. Um, um, yeah, we can go through. I have actually until 7.15 to go through the stream with you guys. So we can work on option two or three. So if anybody wants to come on screen and describe any part, I can invite you up if you say like a comment like, ooh, I want to talk about part C. Like if you comment like I just did, then there's a button that I can click next to your logo that'll allow me to invite you up on screen. Or if you comment like, I want to type part D2, like then you can just type it out in the comments and I'll wait for your response. So comment if you voted for option two or three and you can work on that. If you just wanted option one, thank you guys for coming. You guys don't have to watch people talk about the answer to this FRQ if you really want to try to do it on your own. But if you want to do option two or three, please stick around and watch us go through this. So if you guys want to comment what you personally want to do, then that's fine. But I'll give you a few more minutes to read over the FRQ, too. I want to type part B1. Okay, go for it, Jocelyn. Type it out for me. And I will go through and grade it with you. I'll pull up the scoring guidelines just to grade it just like an AP reader would. 
if you don't want to write the whole thing or you want to write it on bullet points, that's fine. For right now, just so I can look at it. The part that Doxlin wants to do is part BI, which says, in addition to water quality prob quantity problems, the Everglades is faced with a variety of water quality issues. For example, phosphorus concentrations in the Everglades have increased since the 1960s. <gasps> now, Jocelyn wants to describe how one specific activity, human activity, contribute to the increased phosphorus levels in the Everglades. Oh, this part is easy. You got this, guys. You can do it. It's just eutrophication like we talked about for, let's see, 50 minutes and 19 seconds so far in this live stream. <laughs> So you guys can type it out right now, and I will go through and grade it for you, or I'll discuss them on screen, too. So if you guys don't want to watch me read these, you guys can go. That's fine. Have a great night. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I really appreciate the number of people that showed up today and showed out. Um, thank you guys so much. After Jocelyn types up her part and graded, I'm just going to end the stream. So thank you. And as always, remember to think Fiveable and follow Fiveable on all social media platforms. Joey says, bye. Thanks for using 51 minutes of my time. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> 52. Yep, 52 minutes and nine seconds right now. Um, while you're typing that out, Jocelyn, I can go through and play a video as long as you're done looking at this. The question is just saying, um, how, why are there increased phosphorus levels? I will pull up a video that I really liked. That's by Hank Green of Crash Course um, to show you guys another point of view, another review about, about, nitrogen, about nitrogen, phosphorus, and eutrophication. Oh my gosh. I'm streaming live right now, and I see an ad for Fiveable, our free live streams. Like, this is not planned. Like, this is not using my cookies or anything. Oh, my gosh. That is so weird. I'm going to have to text her about that later. Okay. Other organisms need, like, really need in order to grow and respire and exist. So when we go and make, like, ludicrous amounts of these nutrients available, He's talking about nitrogen and phosphorus nutrients. Eutrophication. Killing everything that needs oxygen. Hypoxic zones, guys. Okay, so that's where he talks about eutrophication. I think that he did a really good job of explaining it. Hopefully that gave you another perspective and voice besides me. But I'm going to go back to the FRQ example right now as it's loading up. And I'm going to go over what Jocelyn said. So Jocelyn said that um, um, some... Uh, some specific human activities to which increased phosphorus levels in the Everglades. Um, she said urban and agricultural development, uh, increased runoff, increased phosphorus levels, eutrophication, death of aquatic organisms, hypoxic zones. Um, yes, okay. So with the, whenever you say the word runoff on the AP exam to start with, never, ever, 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 ever say runoff. Just like when I was talking about tips with FRQs. Never, ever, 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 ever just say global warming. Never say pollution. Never say carbon dioxide. 
well, unless you're like explaining how carbon dioxide comes in, never just say eutrophication, never just say runoff, never, ever, 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 ever say just those words. You say runoff from rainwater on agricultural fertilizer. You need to say that or you will never get any points, even if it's just an identified question saying what's causing eutrophication, runoff from agricultural fertilizer, rainwater. You need to make sure you connect those two dots or the AP readers will not, they will never give you credit. Also never ever ever cite global warming as the reason for increased temperatures or just say greenhouse gases. You need to explain those words in depth, even if it's just an identify, you need to say what they mean. Here's my little tangent, okay. So I see some good ideas here about um, how there are increased phosphorus levels in the Everglades. So increased runoff, just say runoff from fertilizer, the agricultural, runoff from agricultural development, you could say that, that's a reason. You could also say the increased phosphor levels are caused by the death of aquatic organisms. Um, not really, they can cause the death of aquatic organisms. Oh, 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 she's doing part two now, okay. So one way that increased phosphor levels can affect the Everglades ecosystem, boom, that causes the death of aquatic organisms. Um, and then, the eutrophication, yep, that's the process that's happening. Hypoxic zones are when there is no dissolved oxygen left for the fish to survive in the water. Good job. So I really encourage you guys to go look up this FRQ. Um, see if you can do the parts on your own. Write it down. Maybe even time yourself while you have all this free time on your break. As always, follow Think Fiveable on social media, and have a great night, guys. Um, I'll be here for a few more minutes if you have any more questions in the comments. Um, I hope that the session tonight was really helpful for you, uh, and have a great night. I'll be around in the chat and ask a question section for a little bit longer as I do some post-stream responsibilities, but I just won't be on screen anymore. Have a great night, guys.